Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Acting Prime Minister. Justine Greening, good morning to you too, and thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you. On this, Thanks for having me. On this special edition this morning, our first time in front of an audience. We'll treat them as a bit of a focus group. Now I think, you tell today. me. <laughs> <laughs> we'll treat them as your focus group. Fair uh, we can test out your views mm -hmm. and, uh, and your policies as Prime Minister, and we'll be asking for your questions and your input in a, in a few moments. Um, for those unfamiliar with the format of this podcast, essentially what we're going to do this morning, Justine, is ask you just to imagine for the next hour or so that you have been promoted from your corner of Parliament, the, the naughty, naughty corner. corner. I know, although every As corner is known. naughty now, right? Pretty so, much, yeah. Uh, they caught up. <laughs> but you're going to be promoted from that, that favoured <laughs> corner uh, into Downing Street for the day. So let's just start with you imagining you're walking up that street. <laughs> You've walked up it before, of course, in many different cabinet roles. But this time it says Prime Minister, you walk through that front door, that big black door, you close it behind you. What do you think you would be feeling at, at that moment? Would it be excitement, terror? Is it something that you've dreamt of? No, not something I've dreamt of. I didn't go into politics to particularly have a role, but I would be massively excited because I'd know I had a chance to deliver a Britain with equality of opportunity for the first time. So you would be ready to kind of get stuck in as Prime Minister? Totally. I mean, there are, there are all sorts of questions around leadership at the moment. We know there is going to be a vacancy, so let's just get this one out of the way before we start. Is it something that you would like to, to, to do? Is it something that you are thinking of going for? I'd consider it, and that's what I've said. And so I don't know when the leadership contest will happen, um, but for me, it's always been about a vehicle for changing Britain for the better. Simple as that. So if you look at that field of candidates who do go for it and you think there isn't someone here who believes in what I believe in, at that point, do you think you will throw your hat in the ring? That would be one of the reasons why I might do it. Do you think it's sort of a greater than 50% chance? I'm pushing you a bit here. Well, to be honest, it's a broader question for the Conservative Party. You know, you can't lead if people don't fundamentally want to follow. So I think it's probably less a question about where I'm at. I know where I'm at. I know what I stand for. It's more a question for my party about whether they share my ambitions for our country. If it was looking like a kind of a Boris Johnson leadership race with maybe Jacob Rees-Mogg on his ticket as Chancellor, do you think you could stay in a party led by that kind of team? Well, I don't think it would be a successful team. You know, you're not going to win elections by fishing in a voter pool that probably represents about 30% of the country. Although it represents a huge percentage of Tory members. Maybe, That's but... That's the challenge, isn't it, in the next race? I've won in somewhere like Putney by getting people's support who are not traditional Tories. And that's how you win elections, is by actually having a broad base of support. You know, you need to represent more than just your own party if you're going to win in this country. And if you're going to have a genuine consensus for what you are trying to achieve. Do you worry that at the moment the Prime Minister is tacking too much to the ERG? I mean, all right, she's having talks with Labour right now, but generally speaking, she's been very, very concerned about that wing of the party. Do you think that's the wrong approach? <laughs> I think, I think th the reality is that um, the last election showed that having a conservative, a ukip light coalition wasn't enough to win. We didn't reach into the centre ground. 48% of people who didn't vote for Brexit didn't like the fact that they were simply told Brexit means Brexit and voted accordingly. So, no, we've got to be in the centre ground, but with an ambitious set of policies to improve our country. You are passionate about the centre ground, clearly. That's what you're telling me right I'm now. I'm passionate about social mobility, but I think that's actually the centre ground. So we, have you been tempted at all by the independent group? Well, I think I re really respect what they've done um, because I think it takes some real courage to walk away from your party. But for me, I mean, let's face it, I've already been voting against the deal <laughs> for a second referendum. So I don't think um, becoming part of them necessarily will change how I vote in Parliament. So, so I, I've stayed in, in my own party and I want to see the Conservative Party step up to the plate and be a credible mainstream party. Last question on this, and then we'll get on to your, your sort of vision as Prime Minister. But it must be difficult at the moment. You've got lots of friends in the party you have left, particularly from your naughty corner. Nick Bowles has just left, for example, not to join the independent group, but to sit as a, what he calls a progressive Conservative. Do you, do you consider leaving the party? Is it something that you've had to have a think about? I've said I think the party needs to take some decisions about changing. And if it's unable to do that, and if it simply just drifts off towards becoming 
purely, as I've called it, the Brexit party, then I think that that's not the kind of Conservative Party that I joined many, many years ago. It's not what I think a Conservative Party, a modern Conservative Party, really stands for. If we're just defined by Brexit, then, well, frankly, we haven't got the wider agenda that people want to see. And, and the problem with Brexit is it's been the tail wagging the dog. You know, what people want to see is a wider agenda of which Brexit is part, but instead what they saw was nothing apart from Brexit. And that's the wrong way round. So you be a mistake to frame the Conservative Party the wrong way round is what I'm saying. OK. All right. Let's go back to you being prime minister now. <laughs> and you've you walked through that door. You sat down at your desk. The phone is ringing off the hook because every world mm -hmm. leader wants to congratulate the new prime minister of mm -hmm. Britain. Who do you think you'd like to pick up to first? Which world leader would you love to speak to first? Well, I guess, first of all, I'll talk to the Downing Street staff about what I care about and what I'm trying to accomplish. But after that, I'm sure I'll speak to you know, major world leaders. But to be honest, you need to be talking to people like Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah. Um, he's not a person who runs a country, but let's face it, some of the superpowers in today's world are companies. Mm. And we generally need to find a way of reflecting that in how we take decisions. Had, had it been a time, any other time, when Britain wasn't consumed by Brexit, this major issue of the power of data and information how it's handled and the need for a world system, if you can call it like that, to protect the weak from the strong. Mm. That would have been a debate that Britain would have been all over with all of our creativity in shaping it. And that's what that's I'd want to right. do. So what would you love to say to Mark Zuckerberg on that phone call? Shape will be shaped, basically. Um, we have more responsibility for the role that social media plays. And, and let's work collectively on how you strike an appropriate balance between freedom of speech yeah. and privacy. Yeah. And let's not, for example, fall into the, uh, a kind of overly philosophical trap, of you, as you've seen in the States, on gun control, where you have this, the right to bear arms, that mm. now seems to have utterly got that country into what seems to be a, a quite dysfunctional place mm -hmm. on gun control. You don't want that to happen in this area because it's hugely important. And the whole way through history, you know, whenever the latest version of power has arisen, you know, in, in obviously 17th, 18th century, it was military power, 19th, 20th century, it was economic power. The world system has always adapted. You know, we've ended up with NATO, the UN, the World Bank, the IMF. Yeah. We don't have that for the latest power, which is information and knowledge, and we probably need it. So do you think the balance has tipped too far in favour of, you know, free speech effectively, because that's what their argument that's not is, what I'm it? saying. you can't curtail it. What I'm saying is, up until now, up until now, all of those forms of power were wielded by countries. Yeah. And so the world could get together and the countries could hopefully find some agreement on how to deal with it. Now it's more complex because some of those superpowers, as I said, are, are co companies and they're outside of our normal political system and we're having to catch up with that. Do you feel some of the impact personally as an MP of social media companies not necessarily regulating themselves effectively? You know, do you get a lot of abuse? Do you feel fed up with the amount of stuff you get on Twitter and Facebook? I, I think I get less than other MPs. Um, but I still think that for young people particularly, the sort of trolling that they get and the impact that has on mental health um, I think is wrong and it's one of the reasons whilst um, I was in education that I wanted to update some of those other guidelines that I think get affected like relationships and sex mm. education. Mm. Right, you've got to appoint your cabinet now and you can mm -hmm. pick anyone from history, dead or alive, politician, non-politician, who would you love to have in your cabinet as Prime Minister? Well I thought a couple of good people, um, I'm actually a massive fan of Jurgen Klopp, I think you need mm -hmm. some good team team managers. Um, I know everyone's going on about military, but you know the thing about cabinet, it's first among equals. So you can't do coercive management. Um, <laughs> you have to bring people with you. So I think you're going to be good to have on side. Um, and then frankly, I was thinking, I'm going to have a massive disruptor. I want Steve Jobs. Really? Things okay. have got to change. And I don't want incremental evolution in some areas. I yeah. think it needs to be a touch of revolution and he's the man to help me do that. This is me like the technological government of the future then if you're chatting to Mark no, Zuckerberg no, and you've it's, got it's Steve not. Jobs it's in there. It's the creative government that strips problems back to first base and then says, how do we do them now, not 20 or 30 years ago? Okay. Looking at the current cabinet and you've sat in there alongside many of these figures, <laughs> who would you like to get rid of? Because you can sack people too, right? 
Well, to be honest, um, I think they've all been pretty woeful in their judgment calls on Brexit. This is the biggest challenge facing Britain, and they've either taken bad decisions or no decisions. Do you think a lot of the decisions being taken at the moment are with one eye on leadership? Yeah, of course, and that's completely wrong. I actually think in a funny way, it's this old politics that people are fed up about. It's all about manoeuvring, um, and it's not about what you stand for. People voted for Jeremy Corbyn in 2017 because they had a sense that he was someone who stood for something. Now, frankly, uh, I don't agree with his policies, but I think people understood that he knew what he was about. Mm. Nobody knows what most politicians are about at the moment, and that's why they're so disillusioned, because it seems to be more about them and their careers than it is about the country. And I was someone who was prepared to walk away from cabinet because I think there are some things that are way more important to me mm. than my political career. And I'm on the back benches, but I'm campaigning on the thing I care about, which is social mobility. Because just to remind people, you did leave cabinet. You, you were offered a different job. You didn't want to take that job. It, I was stood outside Downing Street <laughs> for quite some time <laughs> waiting to find out what was going on in there. And just remind people what, what happened you know, inside, inside Downing Street, what was going on at that moment during that reshuffle. I was Secretary of State for Education. That was the job that I'd always wanted to do. Mm, you because loved that job. Yeah, because I went through the state education system and teachers transformed my life and my prospects. So that's what I was passionate about. I think the biggest challenges in Britain are young people feeling like they don't have enough opportunities, people feeling like they don't have a stake in this country, people feeling like they're climbing up a different ladder to other people that doesn't have e as many rungs on it. That's what I wanted to fix. And I wanted to stay in education to be able to continue to do that. But if I couldn't, mm. then, you know, I wasn't obviously pleased about that. But at the end of the day, it didn't stop me from being able to continue working on the thing that I think matters most, which is, which is social mobility. And in fact, for the past year, I've been pursuing an initiative that I launched called the Social Mobility Pledge. Mm. Which you, we're going to come on to in a minute. Which we're going to come on to, hopefully. In a, in, a, in a proper chunk in a minute. And I'm that's really getting companies engaged and acting on this agenda, which I think is the other missing part of it, in a way. OK. We'll talk about your agenda as Prime Minister in a moment, but let's just get some other pressing issues out of the way that are going to be on your desk. So, firstly, you'd have to go to the EU Summit on Wednesday. Um, what kind of extension do you think you'd ask for from the EU? Well, you probably need six months to do a referendum, mm -hmm. which is what I, th I think you just need to unblock this. And I think people deserve a choice, frankly, on what they think is the right route forward now. So probably, I think if you went to the end of the year, I, I think you've got two choices either. And I, I probably talked to business about what was best. Either you do a, m a December year end mm -hmm. um, date or you do a March year end date um, and effectively, you have a referendum, and the, the, the choices people have got are very clear-cut. You can have revoke if you want to remain. You can have Parliament pass through the Prime Minister's withdrawal bill unamended mm. um, if you vote for her deal. Or you can have a WTO clean-break Brexit, and that statutory instrument with that date will be dated the day after the referendum. What do you <coughs> make of her, the Prime Minister, talking to Jeremy Corbyn at the moment, trying to come up with some kind of compromise? I think it's a bit of a mess because I'm not convinced it's going to succeed. I think it's pretty toxic for Conservative candidates out there busting a gut on local elections right now. This is somebody that we've said uh, isn't fit to be near the levers of power, and now we've invited him in to help shape our Brexit strategy. I think most Conservative MPs and activists are actually staggered that the Cabinet felt this was a sensible approach. There is talk of them agreeing to put a people's vote back to Parliament again for another... another well, they could have taken MPs. a decision to do that. Um, <laughs> Why do you need Jeremy Corbyn? <laughs> you know, there's, there's enough Labour MPs who want to see a confirmatory vote on whatever deal Parliament passes. Mm -hmm. That's been clear for months. Although it keeps getting voted down in Parliament. Every time it comes up as an option, people's vote hasn't managed to garner a majority. Well, I mean... Let's give Parliament a break as well. We started doing indicative votes on Wednesday, the week before last. By last Monday, we come closer to finding a consensus on something, mm -hmm. on two things actually, um, one of which was a referendum, than the government had managed in three years. So four days, more progress, nearly made it. And so now I think we did quite well, to be perfectly honest. But yeah, you're right. Um, 
the, the, the vote that got the most support was a confirmatory uh, referendum. We'd wanted to have more votes on Monday, but that was blocked by government. I suppose ultimately what I'm asking you is if, if she gets together with Jeremy Corbyn, she agrees a package that involves a customs union, Parliament having a say on a second referendum, some kind of bigger, bigger say for Parliament in the future relationship as well. Is that the kind of deal you could ultimately get behind? I've always said I will support any deal uh, that Parliament votes for as long as it's given to the people for them to have their say. In so this, so yeah. in if this case Parliament be can get behind... In this um, case, it wouldn't be certain, would it? The people's vote wouldn't be absolutely certain. It would be so. I, I think at this stage, people have to be allowed to say on the direction forward. Okay. All right. Let's get away from Brexit now. The whole point of this podcast is not to talk about Brexit. So, next issue in your in tray, Brunei, which is an interesting one that's come up this week. Do you think Brunei should be expelled from the Commonwealth for the new laws it's passed, which ultimately uh, allow the death penalty for same sex relations? I think what's happening in Brunei is totally unacceptable and out of kilter with the values of the Commonwealth. And I think the Commonwealth should meet in order to discuss what our con consistent agenda on this needs to be. Because I think that, m like most people, I'm, I'm pretty shocked at what's gone on. But let's be honest, there are other countries who take a not dissimilar True. approach. So the key is having a consistent pro approach across the piece. but. You know, it's a good example of how um, in any other time I think we would be playing a much stronger role on the uh, world stage fighting for human rights, including LGBT rights, than we are able to at the moment because we're simply because consumed by our own internal struggles on Brexit. And just staying on LGBT issues for a moment then, as you mentioned earlier, as Education Secretary, you started the process of introducing relationship and mm. sex education in, in all schools. What do you make of the protests by parents outside some schools in, in Birmingham, which has led to several of them actually withdrawing LGBT lessons from the curriculum? Do you think it's right for parents to protest? Do you think it's right for those schools to withdraw the lessons? I think I, I was always clear that, um, well, I think it, it, it shows why you needed to make a step forward mm. because the guidelines were so out of date. They were for a very different version of Britain than the one we're living in today. Um, and it also shows that, um, frankly, if children don't get a consistent education within school on relationships and sex education, then yes, they may not get that at home either. Um, but I was always clear in my mind that this needed to be age appropriate. Yeah. And when it came to more intimate relationships, which would only be part of a secondary school curriculum, mm. that parents should have the right to withdraw their child until basically that child got to an age when, frankly, uh, they were able to make their own decisions. So it was about striking a balance, but the bottom line is, um, you know, young people need to, uh, need to understand about a modern Britain, and, and frankly, LGBT issues cut across, of course, um, mm. religions and culture. So, you know, we can't really have w one cohort of young people not able to get the benefit of RSE when the rest of their peers are. Do you think the government then should provide those schools with a bit more help to stand firm against parents withdrawing children? I mean, at the moment you can voluntarily withdraw your child anyway, but perhaps stand firm against the protests and the pressure that means that no children at the moment are getting those LGBT rights. I think vaccines. they should support heads that are getting on with um, implementing these new guidelines, new approaches, because frankly, they really, really matter. Mm. And I think for a whole range, a whole generation of LGBT young people growing up in our schools, who frankly deserve better than to be given the impression that the future relationships they're going to go on and have in their lives are somehow bad and wrong, we owe it to them to make sure that our schools are able to do a proper approach, a modern approach on relationships and sex education. And that's precisely uh, one of the many reasons why I got on with this, alongside the fact that, as we talked about, the online world now poses huge risks and it's hard mm. for young people to manage those risks if they don't understand they exist in the first place. Okay, right, you've got the topical stuff done now as Prime Minister. Now you can start to think about your vision for the future. So you've got to make a speech as Prime Minister. What do you think the personal anecdote or the personal backstory is that you would draw on to try and explain to the people, this is what I believe in, these are my values as Prime Minister? I think it would quite simply be that I'm somebody that understands what not having enough opportunity in your, look, in your life feels like and looks like. 
And that's, you know, in a sense, one of the things that drives me. I want to fix that for people growing up today. Um, I know what it's like to feel a million, a million miles away from the aspirations and dreams that you'd like, mm. with, with not necessarily a clear sense of how to even connect yourself up to them. So, so in a sense, that's where I'm coming from. And I think that I've always said talent spread evenly, it's opportunity that isn't. Mm. So my message to every single person who wants to make something of themselves but thinks that they're disconnected from the chance to do that, that's what I want to fix. Just tell me why it is that you know how that feels, because not everyone will be familiar with your background. Well, I grew up in Rotherham in the 80s. Um, a lot of people were losing their jobs at the time. I mean, it was a time when the steel and coal industry um, were, were in dire straits. One of those people was my dad. And so I know what it's like to be in a family with unemployment. I also know what it's like to feel like there isn't much opportunity on your doorstep. Mm. And to have a sense that if you're going to get it, you're going to have to move, literally leave your family, quite probably, and go somewhere totally different that you don't know about. And how almost motivated you've got to be to be prepared to make that step into the unknown. And I know how difficult it is for you when your family themselves can't always give the advice you need mm. because you're talking about a world you want to move into that they've not been part of themselves. And uh, as much as they love you and want to help you, they can't. And I'm the first person in my family who went to university and I remember asking my mum and dad for some advice on that. And my mum said, <laughs> we, you know, we'd love to help, but we just, we probably can't give you advice on that because we don't really know anything about it. W did you get any advice from anywhere? Did you just sort of go to university and figure it out for yourself? I, I got advice from my sixth form college teachers and that helped. But when I look back on it, um, I think my horizons were really limited. So I never thought about doing law because I never met a lawyer, for example. Mm. And it's that kind of thing that I want to change. And, and the reason I did the social mobility pledge was because part of that broadening of young people's horizons is getting companies into schools so that they can talk about all of these different careers okay. that are out there. Let's talk about this because I know that you're really, really keen to, to talk about it properly. So you, as Prime Minister, you can introduce a bill into Parliament. It can be anything that you like. What are you going to focus on? What's, your, what's first on your agenda? Well, we're going to do, first of all, a package. Mm -hmm. So it'll have a number of different elements. Uh, one will be finally getting the credit worthiness assessment bill through Parliament. This is a bill that improves credit scores for up to 50 million renters by having their regular rent payments actually count. Okay. So we're going to do that to um, enable up to 50 million renters to get better, more affordable credit. Uh, we're going to bring back maintenance grants, frankly, um, anything like that that stops young people from more disadvantaged backgrounds getting to the university they want because they're worried about living costs is bad and we need to fix that. Because you asked about that loads of times as Education Secretary, will you bring them back? And, and we were always pushing, pushing to get that yeah. done and, we, and, and so that's something we can fix. There's a broader reform of higher education around the graduate contribution that would enable us to scrap fees and debt um, so going you would, forward. So you would scrap fees? Yeah, I've said I think it should move to almost like national insurance. Mm -hmm. um, everybody uses the NHS, so everyone pays national insurance, but for graduates who've used their higher education system, they should pay the graduate contribution mm -hmm. to go into a higher education fund that means the next generation can then get the same kinds of opportunities that they've had themselves. What else have I got down here? Oh, tons, yeah, we'd expand opportunity areas. Um, these are bespoke pieces of work really helping to improve education in uh, communities that need it the most. Mm -hmm. um, we've only got 12 of those. Frankly, we should be doing tons more. Let's do, say, 100. Uh, let's complement those areas with tax incentives of companies who are there so that they're actually not just focused on improving education outcomes, but actually we incentivize companies to get in there and develop uh, careers and jobs um, on their doorstep. Um, what else have we got? Oh, but that's the sort of policy thing I'd get on with. Yeah. Um, government, of course, absolutely needs to change. I mean, Treasury massively needs reform. It doesn't know how to value investment in people. So really, to that extent, it's not fit for purpose and, and needs a massive reform. We never plan long term in Britain. Our, our next spending review will be three years. I mean, like, that's nothing. Most, most that's, like, that's like a, a person planning for three days. Yeah. So we need a much longer term horizon on fiscal rules and planning. If we did that, then maybe we would start to value investment in young people that won't really generate a return to this country until they come into the workplace. 
Um, and then finally, I'd have an agenda around Parliament change, because let's face it, um, it is a bit old-fashioned. Um, I'd want to see more cross-party bills. Okay. Um, and if I had any more time left, I might do a bit of House and Lords reform, because frankly, <laughs> if there's a who you know, not what you know central, it's, it's the, the House, House of, of Lords. Lords, probably, isn't it? Okay, so what, you get rid of hereditary peers altogether? Well, I think, I think it's stuffed full of political appointees. Mm. And, and some of them do a job for just a few months, so frankly. So it's the political appointees, almost, that uh, you yeah, take I just more think exception it's, to. I, I, what, I, what, I dis what I disagree with is people who know someone who've then had a job for a little bit of a time, mm -hmm. then maybe the Prime Minister changes. They're still there voting on laws. Why? So what would be a better way, then, of appointing people? Oh, I think you start to look at people who've actually done stuff for their local communities, maybe been awarded an MBEOB, <coughs> that kind of thing, who we've actually recognised for contributing to Britain. So it could be I'd like, like the honours system where there's a bit more of a process, people apply. Yeah, I mean, you should reform the honours system, of course, as well. But um, I, I think, you know, that the House of Lords is, I mean, it's so London and South East focused, let's face it. Mm. Would you I mean, all this is what, what I'm trying to say, and this is why you need Steve Jobs in, in the cabinet. What I'm trying to say is we need to get to the nub of what we're trying to do here, which is basically Britain is stuffed full of massively talented people who don't get to realise their potential mm. because of the way the system works. Now, there are lots of people in the system who are quite happy with the status quo because they do fine from it. But what I'm here to say, what my government would, that would be there to do is to say, well, I'm sorry, but when... We have a Britain where maybe only 30% of people get to reach their potential. That's bad for everyone, mm -hmm. and it does need to change, and it needs to change sooner rather than later, and that needs to go across the board. A and then the final thing that I would want to come back to is that government can only fix part of this problem. So thinking government can pull some levers and then social mobility gets sorted out is wrong. It needs communities, but especially companies, mm -hmm. really stepping up to the plate. That's why I launched the pledge. If yeah. you think about it, we're spending £45 billion a year on primary and secondary schools alone. We nurture that talent, it comes out of our education system, and then what? Nobody really knows. We have to have a stronger strategy on that, and that's what I've been doing over the past year. I want to ask you a bit more about the Social Mobility Pledge, because there's a lot of focus at the moment, generally, in, in our society on diversity. Um, you know, there's been a, a huge push to improve gender equality. There's been a, mm -hmm. a, a huge debate around the fact that people from BAME backgrounds often don't have the, uh, the same ladder mm. provided to them. There hasn't been as much focus on mm. class <coughs> diversity at the top. And maybe that's because it's harder to measure. So some of these things are easy to tick off, or at least to measure first. That gender is quite easy to ask mem you know, mem members of staff which gender they belong to, although increasingly there's a debate around that too, I guess. Um, same with ethnicity, it's easy to put on the form. Harder to measure social class though, isn't it? And, and that, would be, that would be a challenge for social, social mobility. How do you ask people which background they've come from? The measurement, um, I think, is something that's been lacking, to be honest. And yet, when you look at some organisations like Nottingham Trent University, they've done a really good job of tracking and measuring. And so the answers are out there, Paul. It's just a question of finding out who's already nailed it well mm. and then harvesting those ideas. And, and really, that's part of what the pledge is there to do. But it, it, it's partly measurement. And, and we've got to recognise, I mean, why, have, why haven't we fixed this? I mean, it, it feels pretty outrageous to me that you've got different people getting different opportunities for random facets of their life. And the answer yeah. is actually when it comes to social mobility, it's because you can't see it. You can't exactly, see that's my point. weak social mobility. So you do need to track it better. How do you do that? How, what kind of measures do you think? Because you do have some in your social mobility pledge around you know, educational attainment versus the average for that school, all that sort of stuff, to try and show when people are performing above where they would be expected to perform given the hand they've been dealt in life? Well, I, th I think one of the, so, so what, for example, what Nottingham Trent University, University was doing, um, and they did this in order to make sure that perhaps young people from more disadvantaged backgrounds who are more likely to drop out mm. didn't, they just simply tracked their levels of engagement. Um, and they did that from a variety of different perspectives. It's actually been hugely successful. But of course, the best thing about it was, yes, of course, it caught perhaps young people away from home for the first time, um, finding it hard, maybe likely to be from disadvantaged backgrounds, but it also caught 
kids who'd had a much better start, but who maybe had just had a parent die or something mm -hmm. else go on. So the reason that approach worked was it, it had a level of equality around it that, yes, tilted towards social mobility, but didn't leave behind young people facing a whole load of challenges mm. because of nothing to do with their start, because of other things that were then happening. And, and I think it can start to point the way forward more broadly for companies. And actually, we're sharing some of that knowledge now with other companies who are doing the pledge. Okay, well, we'll ask the audience in a moment what they think of uh, Prime Minister Greening. Um, but before we get to that, just a, a few quick fire questions for you. Firstly, how would you de-stress as Prime Minister, do you think? What do you enjoy doing to kind of shake off a day-to-day -day parliamentary procedure? Oh, God, well, I socialise, obviously. Um, you like running, don't you? I love running. I love sport, actually. I'm a bit big sports person. I love watching sport, although I have to say that FA Cup semi-final yesterday was dull. I haven't got any football chat. Dull, so dull, dull. I if I'd known that first goal was going to be it, I might have done something else. I love watching things like You've Been Framed. Honestly, anything <laughs> visually hysterical. Um, I, I just absolutely kill myself and all that stuff. Um, I love ITV reading. Show, I, you so know, I, I don't know. I guess I do what most people do, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> um, what would your Downing Street pet be? Well, I've got two pets, actually, already, mm -hmm. so I think they'd have to move in. Uh, these two RSPCA rescue cats. They've just arrived, oh. actually. So I've only had them, we've only had them for about three months. So they're, they're beetling about um, and uh, interact. Um, Cleo, which is this uh, black cat, and then Rollo, which if you type into the internet is the beginning of Roll on Friday, ah, um, okay, which seemed nice. like an appropriate, <laughs> <laughs> an appropriate way to pick a name, basically. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> so they're just they're just having a great time interacting with the big fat next door neighbour <laughs> cat at the moment. They might fight with Larry then if they moved in, but I think well I think they're probably scarper because they're only little. Oh, um, <laughs> where would you love to go on holiday as prime minister? Because that be, you know PMs are always snapped on the beach or walking in the hills if it's prime minister Theresa May. Where would well, you go? So I. I think, I think f for, for, for me and Tess, it's, it's generally a bit of a mix. So sometimes we like to just chill, mm. in which case we'll go somewhere nice and warm and hot. And, 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 and I love swimming, so, so that's, that's what we'll do. That's probably what we'll do this year. But I also, I love geography. And so last year we went to Canada and it was the most amazing experience. Went to the Rockies. And, and so I, I think we like to kind of, pick other countries with mm. stuff to really marvel at. So sort of physical geography you like, like going and looking at giant lakes and glaciers mm. and, mm. okay. Yeah, so this year, you know, we'll, we'll probably be heading to Italy and maybe um, have a look at some of the, I don't know, we'll try and see a volcano hopefully. Mm -hmm. Nice. <laughs> okay, last one. Which song would you dance to at party conference if you had to do a Theresa May? Ooh, well, obviously it would be an ABBA song. Um, <laughs> That goes without saying. <laughs> so it would probably be, let's think, well, God, I don't know. Um, my favourite ABBA song is actually Thank You for the Music, but it's not okay. really a dance song. I don't know. Because she had Vu dancing Vu, queen, maybe. of course. She did, she indeed. When she tried to make up for her dodgy moves in Africa, <laughs> uh, which I was there to witness, <laughs> the privilege of a lifetime. Obviously um, didn't scar you for life. <laughs> Seems to have bounced back. <laughs> we just got that story <laughs> right to the top of the bulletin that night. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so you might, you might be uh, in the ABBA club with Theresa May. That's interesting. Right, audience questions for Justine Greening. Hi. Uh, I was going to ask you, which single current Labour politician do you respect the most? Mm. And would you let them into your cabinet or any other Labour politicians? Mm, interesting. Crikey, that's a good question. Is there someone you've shadowed that you've thought? Well, I'll tell you what, I, I don't know whether I'd have um, them in my cabinet, but uh, I, I think I would point to Peter Carl, Phil Wilson and Margaret Beckett, who've done a huge amount of work on cross-party support for a, a confirmatory um, vote. And I think I really respect them for what they've done. So they get a massive tick from me. And it's one of the reasons why when we had indicative votes um, and they made that proposal, the next name on that list after their three was mine. The Parliament has really struggled lately to find areas of compromise. Do you think maybe the system needs to be reformed 
so that we don't just have this adversarial politics anymore, one party winning majority or not, as the case may have been recently, versus another? Do we, do we need more consensus in our politics? Do we need to change the electoral system? I don't know. What, what do we need in order to introduce that? I think, well, well I think in terms of what the problem is, I mean, the problem is that Parliament systematically fails to come up with long-term solutions that stick. Mm. And it's not good at dealing with complex problems because politics is, is perhaps necessarily too short term. So, th you know, you've seen that in Brexit. I mean, the only difference with Brexit is it was a long term complex problem that had a deadline. So it's been obvious. Mm. Um, but if you look at social care, housing, mm. social mobility, they're all the same. It's just they didn't have a deadline. But we've missed the deadline, of course, um, as usual. So there is need for reform. I, I think one simple, quick way of doing it, for example, would be private members' bills. These are bills that an individual MP can do. You look at my um, clunkily named but high-impact credit worthiness assessment bill to help renters. That's got not just cross-party support, all party support. Mm. There's tons of these bills. They're often driven by local issues that have really sh shone a spotlight on something that needs to be sorted. And they're all there ready to be passed, but we only get one Friday every once in a while. Why don't we just devote more time in Parliament to getting some of these bills that everybody's behind through? Mm -hmm. And on the back of that, then perhaps, yes, learn about how we can do more cross-party working. Um, because to my mind, it seems to be the last resort, as we've seen in Brexit, when perhaps um, it needs to be more of a first resort. OK, we we'll need to let you go in a minute because you've got to go to the boat race today, which is quite a nice mm -hmm. way mm. to spend a Sunday. Um, but before you go, do you think Britain is ready for a gay prime minister? I don't see why not. Mm -hmm. Totally, yeah. Do you think the Conservative Party is ready for a gay leader? Why not? I mean, I, yes. I mean, I genuinely when you look think... look at the membership, they are, the, no, they're older, they're more cons no, conservative of the small C. No, I would say for all the challenges our party has... You think you're over that uh, hurdle now? Yeah, I mean, I don't think that question would even arise, to be perfectly honest. You know, and I've seen, I think you've seen that with Ruth Davidson in, in Scotland. I, I just I genuinely think we have got a lot of challenges as a party, not least how on earth do you reach out to, to young people? Um, but I think, you know, no, that's absolutely, I'm pleased to say, not one of them. Do you worry, though, if you, if you ran for leader, put the gay issue to one side, now we've dealt with that, but in terms of your other policies, they're very progressive, they're very centrist. Do you worry that the membership isn't on the same page, that you'd struggle because you know, party membership has declined and now you're sort of left with this quite concentrated rump of party members, if I can be so rude about them, who, who aren't necessarily centrist? Well, I think that actually most of them probably do agree with me that we're nothing if we're not the party of opportunity. Mm. That what inspired me to get more involved um, was that it was about effort and reward. I, I never wanted anything other than a level playing field. And the time when my party's done the best, and the last time we won a landslide is now a, s a shocking 32 years ago, was when we were talking about opportunity. It was when we were prepared to be a party that would get sharp elbowed about change in order to make that happen. And that's what we have to get back to if we want to be successful again. If, if we're just seen as the party of privilege, the party of the status quo, mm. at a time when, actually, I know we're all almost transfixed by politics, but actually it's really exciting. We've got a country of people that really do want to see change. And that's a good thing, and we should be harnessing in that, capturing that excitement and saying, yeah, we've got an agenda that can match it, actually, and we can bring it alive. So we can take your ideas about what you want and we can actually make them happen if we choose to step up to the plate. Uh, but, you know, I'd really underline the fact that we all have to realise it's not just about government. If you're going to deliver equality of opportunity in Britain for the first time, it's not just about government. That's a big part of the, the, the jigsaw, of course, but it's about business as well. It's about businesses deciding that they are going to actively tilt opportunity towards those young people who perhaps are less likely to get it. They have to be part of changing the status quo too, but the good news is they can, and many of them already are. Okay. On that rallying cry, we'll leave it there. Thank you, Justine Green. You've been a fascinating acting Prime Minister. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you to the audience too for questions. Thank you.